the glory. The glory of the Lord resides in you and He wants it to flow out of you to bless His name and give honor to Him. It's so easy to worship Jesus. You just lift your hands and say, Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. You're awesome, Jesus. You're great, Jesus. You're holy, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. Worthy is the Lord. Worthy is the Lord. Worthy is the Lord. All right, Father, you see our hearts. You see our hearts. And your word said in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of those whose heart is perfect towards you. So find in us a perfect heart towards you this morning. Find in this house, find in this place, in this people, and most of all, find it in me. It's got to be personal to you. Find it in me. And because you can find a heart turned towards you in me, then show yourself strong, mighty, glorious on our behalf today. We receive your revelation. We receive your abundance and your grace and your strength. And we thank you and praise you for it and trust you in it. Mighty is the Lord and worthy is the Lord our God. We bless your name. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we said together, amen, amen, and amen. You may be seated for a moment in the presence of the Lord and in the name of Jesus. It's a good day the Lord has made, and I'm glad you're here this morning. God is a faithful God, and you're a blessed people. You are a blessed people. God is good. Psalms 145, 8 said, The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, and slow to anger, and of a great mercy. The Lord is good to all. He's good to me, good to you, good to us. The Lord is good. So God bless you this morning. Sandra, let's go to the board. I'm glad you're here this morning. God bless you. All right, Tuesday prayer service is 6.30 with Miss Patricia. And uh, she's doing a wonderful job as our prayer director. I appreciate the work she's doing. She's also praying on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock if you'd like to join her. She's not made fanfare about that, but she is praying back here in the classroom of the children at uh, 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings as well. Midweek service is 6.30. We start the Word of Life. We got... Our review done last week and started the text, but this week we'll go there in Philippians 2 and begin to look at this word of life in the new covenant. Today at 3 p.m. is the next session for the financial university. You have to be registered and signed up for that to attend that class. If you haven't registered, that's not for you. That's past. We'll do it again in the springtime when you get your tax returns. People have more money. We'll do it then, and we'll have another session with that. So you haven't missed out on it. We're just going to begin to uh, do that probably on a regular basis to help people. The last class I went to, the first one, it was amazing. I really enjoyed it. I'm already starting to learn, and praise God. All right, today at 5 p.m. is leadership training for ushers, greeters, and women's ministry. Uh, I'm believing God every saint serving in this house. I believe every saint needs to serve, don't you? I believe every saint needs to serve. So if you'd like to help in ushers or greeters, and uh, Mr. Wayne and Mr. Dream are going to organize and reorganize that today and start setting that in order, then please come to the meeting. And, it, of course, it, the, the Dave Ramsey course will end at 5, and we'll start that at 5 o'clock, uh, very much on time. Next elders meeting is Thursday night, September 28th at 7 p.m. for planning for conference and for work day and all the things we have this fall. So, elders, please be mindful of that. But today's leadership training for ushers, greeters, women's ministry, every saint serving in the house. We believe God, everybody put their hand to the plow. Amen. Oh, come on. Amen. Amen. All right. Next page. The next page is looking ahead. Our work day. Oh, we don't need to do that. All right. The shoe box. We've reached the goal now. We're going to bring things in to fill the boxes and funds for shipping. The cost this year is going to be $280. We'll receive an offering for that. And we're also going to get you a list of things you can bring in to fill that. Okay? All right. The work day, looking ahead, our church work day to work on the building and the property will be Saturday, October 21st. So please write that down. We need everybody here inside and out. There's work to be done on the outside of the building and the inside of the building. It takes a lot of work to maintain a building like this. And we have some things that need to be done. And we need a lot of hands. The more hands we have the quicker we can get it done, so be mindful of that. And then conference this year will be on Saturday night, October 28th, Sunday the 29th, and 30th, 
And as we get closer, I'll have to you the schedule of who's coming and what we're going to share. It'll be a great time of celebrating the inheritance and the harvest this year in the name of Jesus. All right, we're praying for Sam and Linda Smith and family this week. And Sam and Linda have been now. All right, we love Sam and Linda and the family. All right, let's stand together. Let's say it. We're a family church, a Bible training center. We are changing Lancaster, South Carolina, and we're excited about Jesus. And you know what will make what will make Open Door go and glow and grow and show and know and sow and flow is two things. When we, with an expectant, excited heart, come together and share Jesus and take that out and share it with people. That's what makes the church happen. That's what makes the church go. It's what makes it glow. You know, if you're not excited about your church, how in the world could you expect anybody else to be? If you don't want to come, how could you invite somebody else to come? If you go to the churches that are growing and, and glowing and, and going forward, they're churches where people have an expectant heart, they have an excited heart, they come in and share Jesus, they take that out, and then they share it with people. So let's do that together. Amen? We believe in God. Our vision is Jesus Christ. Our mission is to preach, teach, and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in all the fullness of His glory and power and to radiate His love to our community and unto all the world. Amen. And I do want to encourage you, we have ministry far beyond an influence, far beyond this local church. We have a lot of churches we network at with and a lot of influence. As a bishop, I have influence over quite a few ministries that I'm imparting to and instructing and impacting with what we do here. And I'm thankful for you because you're home base. You're where this flows out of. Without you, I couldn't do what I do. I appreciate you being connected and being committed and being part of what God's doing. Ushers, come stand with me. It's time to give. You excited about giving this morning? What a great honor it is to give. And there are needs this week in the fellowship. Uh, there's some things we have to do. And this is the third Sunday. Next week is the fourth. So we only have one, two, three, four more offerings this month to get the budget met. And I don't want to raise money for a budget. I want to raise money for ministry and to do ministry. But you know what? It ain't no need to go out here and do ministry if we can't keep the doors open. That'd be like going somebody and going helping your neighbor down the street get groceries and you can't even pay your own electric bill. You need we need to do things here and then take it out. Amen? All right. Father, thank you now for the tithe, the offering and the alms. Thank you. The tithe is holy unto the Lord. It's yours. First fruits belong to you. You said in your word, Proverbs three nine, honor the Lord with thy first fruits and with thy substance. We do it. We just honor you. We honor you. Thank you, Lord, for every person in this room. Thank you. For the tithe of the young people, thank you for the tithe of the aged and all in between. Thank you, Lord, for the seed sown, the offering, and thank you, Lord. We give to the poor, we bless, we help, we sow beyond ourselves. And I thank you that we're increasing in finances, we're increasing. We thank you for early debt cancellation on our debts and the debt of this house. And I thank you that we're free in Jesus' name. We're being freed from the, from the thought of finances and the burden of finances and the care of finances. And thank you that you're multiplying our seed sown. I want this seed in my hand, Father, this seed in my hand to come back to me, good measure, press it down, shaken together, running over. This seed, I thank you for it. It's multiplied in Jesus' name, given back to me this week, and I thank you for increase in every dimension of my life. We said together, amen. All right, let's come around, bring your tithe offering, help me this morning, and let's believe God for great things, and hug your neighbor, love somebody, in Jesus' name.
Get back to your seat. Remain standing, please, if you will. Mommy. Just remain standing with me, if you will. And just to let you know, the church directories we had done in May are in. If you need to get one, you can see Miss Dreamer. And she has those. They are in. They look really nice. Thank you for all the work you did, Miss Streamer. We appreciate that. It's good to see Lena in the house, our our resident sportscaster. Hallelujah. <laughs> Televised TV personality. I prophesied over you, big personality. Going to take you places, right? You're just getting started. Probably be a national anchor for a, like NBC or CBS before it's over, right? NBC or whichever. I don't care. I don't care as long as you get the best job, right? You promise not to forget us, right? Amen. Praise God. I told CD last week when he signs his big contract, pay his tithes. I'm going to tell you the same thing. When you sign your big contract, pay your tithes in Jesus' name. <laughs> going to do big things, make big money. And remember, remember the Lord's house. Amen. Amen. Uh, uh, today, today is... Marge's last Sunday, so we're sad on that note. Her and her husband are, well, he's already been in Seattle for a good while, and so they're heading to Seattle way. So we want to say goodbye to you. We'll pray for you at the end of the service. And so thank you, Marge, for uh, your what you gave us and all you sowed into us and your violin, your love, uh, you know, everything. From We met Marge one night. She was walking her dog, Tommy, and we met her, and we were out there talking, and she came, and y'all have been a very faithful part for the last three years. Thank you so much. And we pray that as we release you, uh, that God will give us some more people like you 
and you've been faithful in your attendance and financing your gift and giving. Thank you. We appreciate that. We want to pray over them today and bless, and it's good to have all of you in the house of the Lord. God's a good God. Amen. All right, remember today at 5 o'clock, those of you that are signed up for financial peace, come on, let's get into it and learn how to prosper, and God's a good God. But before we do all that, we're going to get into Father's Word. You ready? Father wants to talk to us. Father wants to talk to us. We never want to rush and not give Father time to talk to us. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the nursery. Thank you for the children's class. We thank you for the youth. And we thank you for the adults here this morning. Lord, it's our heart to hear your voice. It's our heart to listen and to learn, to take your word deep in our heart, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you this morning that you make each of our teachers and all of our staff able ministers, communicators of the New Testament. Not of the old in letter, but the new in spirit. To communicate it not only by lip, but by life, by light. That we may learn and grow together. That our, our youngest children to our eldest adult will continue to grow and continue to flow. in what you have for us, this new covenant, thank you that these are supernatural men and women of God. They have the mind of Christ. They learn quickly. They receive quickly. They are bright, brilliant, bold, beautiful, blessed people in your kingdom. That's who they are. So we receive your word together, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And in agreement, we said together, amen. All right, children, young people, you may go with your staff. If you're in the auditorium, you can be seated. And we welcome our Internet audience this morning. God bless you. If you are joining us by way of live stream or we'll see this on video, we thank God for you. We appreciate you. Thank you for those of you that are sowing. And I want you to remember these words as we open our Bibles. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Thank all of you on the Internet for all that you're doing and done. Join with us and let's study together. You can open your Bibles to John chapter 20 this morning. That's where we will be when I start. John chapter 20. Back in the month of July 2015, the Lord spoke to me clearly through the Holy Ghost and He said, Tell my people to examine in depth and in detail what I've done for them, what I've given to them in the person and work of my son Jesus. Tell them to embrace it fully by faith. To embrace what Jesus did for you fully by faith. To embrace it until you experience it. Until this becomes reality to you. The gospel is much more than a message. It must become a manifestation. And the Holy Ghost said to me, embrace it until you experience it. And then he said to me, experience it until you can enjoy it. 1 Timothy 6.17 said, God gives us richly all things to enjoy. God wants you to enjoy the food you eat. He wants you to enjoy the company you keep. He wants you to enjoy the clothes you wear, the house you live in. He wants you to enjoy the finances you have. He wants your life to be filled with joy. That's how He created man in the beginning, in that fullness of the blessing. Tell my people to embrace it by faith fully until they can experience it. And out of that experience will come the fruit of enjoying. And from enjoying, he said, if my people will enjoy what I've done and walk in it, then he said, my people will become an expression of who I am and my glory in the earth. Arise, shine, thy light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Isaiah 60, verse 1 through 5. Isaiah prophesied, you will see and your hearts will flow together and your hearts will be enlarged. And if we will see this day, if we will see the new covenant, if we will see him exalted, if we will see what Jesus has done and who Jesus is, then we will start flowing together instead of against each other. And when the body of Christ starts flowing together, supernatural things are going to happen. Psalms 133, behold how good and pleasant it is that brethren dwell together in unity. Isaiah said, you'll flow together, and he prophesied in Isaiah 60, your hearts will be enlarged. And God wants to give you a big heart, not a big head. There are too many Christians with big heads. God wants to give you a big heart. He wants to expand your capacity of heart, because when a man believes with his heart, and he says with his mouth, and Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three, 23, you can have what you say. And God will never be satisfied till a man stands in the earth in his image.
through his redemptive work and begins to have exactly what he says. God prophesied of Samuel, not one of his words fell to the ground. I pray that over you, that your words don't fall to the ground, but your words go into the ground and they become seed that produces mighty harvest in your life. That you have prophetic word over your life, but you have prophetic word coming out of your life that will bring to pass not only God's design and desire, but God's destiny for you in the name of Jesus. So that you are living a life where you are loving and giving and serving and learning to bless without bitterness and serve without strife and sow without sorrow and be diligent without distraction. I know I haven't started preaching, but that's pretty good for an introduction. I've heard less in my time in introduction. That's pretty good. So I've just been following on Sunday mornings that prophetic unction, that prophetic word of the Lord. And it's taken us to this place where we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Let's all take a moment and thank the Lord for that. I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse John 4, 17, as he is... So are we, and if we are, then I am, so am I in this world. I look unto him, the author and finisher of my faith. New covenant faith demands I look away from myself. I look to Jesus. I bless him, and I see him, and as I see him, as he is, so am I in this world. We are now talking about what belongs to Jesus, what was given him by the Father, and what is his rightfully Jesus is the son of David. He's an heir to the throne. He's the son of Abraham. He's heir to the promise. He's the son of man. He's heir to the earth. He's the son of God. He's heir to the heavens. Thus Hebrews chapter 1 says, God appointed him heir of all things, which would include the throne, the promise, the earth, and the heavens. He's heir of all things. The throne, the promise, the earth, and the heavens. Here's some good news. You're a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's some good news. I mean, we've never even yet begun to even begin to believe the reality of that statement. But we are heirs to the throne. We are seated with him in heavenly places. We are heir to the promise, for we are blessed with faithful Abraham. We are heir to the earth, for the meek shall inherit the earth, and the meek has inherited the earth. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. And so we're heir to the earth. God gave the earth to the sons of men. And then we're heir to the heavens, for all things are now ours, 1 Corinthians 3.21. It was given by inheritance. It belongs to you freely given from the heart of love through a father who wanted a family of sons and daughters and in that family he wanted that family richly blessed so that they could operate his kingdom in the earth and bring restoration to a hurting, dying, crying race of people called humanity that are broken by sin and death and sickness and disease and curse and from this temple that we are a river flows out to bring deliverance to the Dead Sea. And the wicked are like a troubled sea. And our Dead Sea is not in the Middle East. Our Dead Sea is in Lancaster and the surrounding areas. And from our inward being is flowing a river that will bring life. And wherever the river comes, it will bring life. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. That's where we're walking today. We're standing on the edge as Ezekiel was brought to the bank of the river. We're looking into these things. And now it's time that we learn to walk in these things. Now, we're studying the blessing of the Lord, and Jesus is blessed this morning. I don't know anybody as blessed as Jesus. Psalms 37, 37 said, Mark the perfect man. He didn't tell you to be the perfect man. He just told you to mark him. You know who the perfect man is. His name is Jesus. Mark the perfect man. Behold the upright. That's look unto Jesus. And then he said, the end of that man is peace which is shalom the end of that man is wholeness completeness soundness the end of that man is wholeness so Jesus is blessed today nobody blessed like Jesus is that true well then there's nobody blessed like you because you're in see he can't be blessed and you not be blessed unless you're in unbelief and nobody blessed like Jesus then there's really nobody blessed like you because you're an heir of God and a... he hath blessed us with all Spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're blessed today. 
You're blessed today. How blessed and rich you are. The Lord bless and keep you. You're blessed today. Thank God. And we're looking at what belongs to Jesus, and that was translated through the father of our faith, which was Father Abraham, and we are blessed with faithful Abraham. So very quickly, one more time. Abraham was spiritually blessed to be made right with God without works or without the law. Without works and without the law, Abraham was made righteous. Then number two, in the soul realm, Abraham was brought to rest. Abraham was brought to rest so that he could hope against hope and believe in hope. And although his body dead and the deadness of Sarah's womb, Abraham was brought to rest in his soul realm. Then number three, he was rejuvenated in his body so that his body was able to produce a child at 99 and 100 years old. God rejuvenated his body and God wants you to live in health and strength. It's the blessing of Abraham, redeemed from the curse of the law because the curse of the law has sickness contained in it and you're redeemed from the curse of sickness through Jesus' blood. So I say over you daily, continually, by whose stripes you were healed. And I'm believing, God, that you live in health and strength all of your days. You don't have to be healed tomorrow. You don't have to be healed next week. You just need to believe that by his stripes you were healed and that you're healed today. You're here in reasonably good health. Believe, God, for health and strength, that your health is rejuvenated, your strength is restored, and that belongs to you. It belongs to you. Abraham lived to be an old, old man because of his faith in God. And God wants you to fill your days in strength. Man is but flesh, but his days shall be 120 years. And we came to church, and preachers talked us out of that, and they took us down to 80. In Psalms 90, the first few verses, man's days are three score and ten, and by reason of strength, 80. And most people believe if they live past 80 years, they're on borrowed time. That's a lie. Psalms 90 was written when God was aggravated and angry with the people and their sins had come up before God in the wilderness every day and God cut that generation short. When God pronounced a blessing on man, he gave man life. When man fell, he lost that life. But even in the judgment of the flood in Genesis 6, God said the days of man shall be 120 years even though he is but flesh. So we need to change our mind about living. We need to change our mind about living and quit thinking about dying. Because most people ask the question, what happens if I die? What am I going to do if I die? That's really not your concern. If you know the Lord, you don't even have to give that a thought. The question should be, what am I going to do if I live? I'm going to live in the earth. I'm going to believe God's glory and walk in what He's given me. So we're rejuvenated. We're righteous. Resting, rejuvenated. The fourth aspect of the blessing is that we are now reconciled to God and God wants us to live without strife, without bitterness, jealousy, anger, wrath, or malice. God wants us to learn to live in harmony with all people so that our loving people is not based on what they do, but it's based on how He loves us. Jesus gave us a new commandment in the new covenant. A new commandment I give you that you love one another even as I have loved you. And this changes our focus from how people act and react to how Jesus loves me. And because Jesus loves me, I can love people. Because Jesus loves me when I'm unlovely, I can love people when they're unlovely. When I don't do what's right before the Lord, He still loves and forgives me because of a sacrifice. And so now when people don't act right and they do things that hurt me, I can still forgive them, not based on them, but based on how He loves and forgives me. Or simply said, we're learning how to deal with people the way God first dealt with us. Because if we let people dictate how we're going to treat them, then we're always going to be up and down and be double-minded. Jesus would say things like, listen, if you love those that love you, what thanks do you get because a sinner does that? And if you bless those that bless you, sinners do that. And if you give to those who give to you, what thank have you? Sinners do that. But Jesus said, love your enemies, pray, bless and do good, even to them that despitefully use and curse you, bless them. And the only way we're going to be able to do that in a right heart, with a right attitude, from the Spirit of God's love, is if we learn how much He loves us. 
So in this study, we're separating ourselves from strife. Strife is not part of me. I have no place with bitterness, and bitterness has no place with me. I have no thought of that in me. God's cleansing me of that every day. I'm free from bitterness and offense till the day of Jesus Christ. That's Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. Then the stronghold of our prejudice is being pulled down. And prejudice runs deep in the church. It runs deep in people's minds and heart. And we gave you 12 kinds of prejudice, and God is removing that from us. And now we're looking at sons and daughters because we're going to have to establish this. If we're ever going to be able to love the way He loves us, we're going to have to know how much He loves us first. How much He loves me, how much He loves you, how much He loves us. And so we went to the book of 1 John chapter 3, 1 and 2. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. That says it all. Behold, don't miss this. Look and see what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. We should be called sons of God. So sons and daughters of God, richly blessed today. Your sons and daughters of God, born again, God is your Father. God is your Father. And you were born of love from the heart of love, because of love, out of love. God so loved the world He gave. The whole motive of the gospel, the whole modus operandi of God was love. That's the whole purpose and the whole reason and foundation for everything that God does in the new covenant was that He loved us freely, giving Jesus to us, for us, and then putting Jesus in us. The motive was love. He loves you with an everlasting love. So behold this love. Don't look the other way. Look at this love. And you best see it in the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection, ascension. See me. Behold the love of God. Then in 1 John 4, 15, he says again, Whosoever shall confess Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he dwells in God. So boldly I confess today Jesus is the Son of God. God dwells in me and I dwell in God. I boldly confess Jesus is, not was, is the Son of God, and God dwells in me and I dwell in God. 1 John 4, 16, and we have known and believed. Now notice the wording, we have known and believed the love God hath toward us. God is love. He that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. We've known and believed. The moment you got born again, you experienced the love of God and it changed you. You'll never be the same. If you genuinely receive Jesus and get born again, you can never be the same. You can never go back. You can never be the same. Once the love of God impacts and touches your heart, you'll never be the same. God's love changes everything. Takes the cold, dead human heart and makes it live again, makes it beat again. There's something about God's love that we can find. No other place in all the universe, every heart is longing for the love of the Father. And so once you get born again, you know the love of God, but then... Unfortunately, we came to church, and I told you what happened to me. In little church with Sister Bland, I was convinced that he loves me because of those flannel graphs, and every Sunday, she would work it back around to you. Now, boys and girls, now Jesus is our shepherd, and he died for our sins on the cross, and he loves us, and Jesus will never leave us and never forsake us, and Jesus loves you. Now, Johnny, little Johnny, talking to me, little Johnny and little Mike and there was Cindy and there was Ronald and Frank and Rick and Jerome and all the people that were in that little children's church. He loves you boys and girls and we got that one. But then when 12 years old came, you had to leave. I couldn't sit in her class anymore. So then I went in big church and was a man up in the pulpit angry telling me all this stuff that I had done that God was really hacked off at me. And so it was kind of confusing because I went from Jesus loves you little Johnny to now you're going to hell. And, you know, your hair's too long. And I'm thinking, man, God is really the fashion police if he's going to throw me in hell because my hair's too long. If your hair's too long back then, there was sin in your heart. You had to get it cut today and make a new start. So the only way you could be right with God back then, according to them, was you had to get a haircut. Well, see, the truth is Jesus paid way too high a price if all it would have taken was me getting a haircut to get right with God. And they were telling me to make things right with God, get right with God by what I could do and taking me further and further and further away from what Sister Bland taught me was, now, little Johnny, Jesus loves you. And so in the translation from little church to big church, man, I got lost and I spent 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 completely, completely separated from any thought or heart or desire for God or the gospel because I thought that he was mean and ugly and mad at everybody and that he was out to punish everybody that didn't do exactly what he said. That's what I thought. That's what I perceived in church. 
Now, if you grew up in a different way, in a different place, thank God for it, but that's what I got. Last day barbecue, you're on the menu. Under, under terrorist preachers. And this is your last chance. And if you don't come make things right with God tonight, you're going to go out of here and get killed. And after all, my sister already been killed in a car wreck, and Karen was the good one. And I'm thinking to myself, Lord, have mercy. And so you ended up, the one preacher came by and preached, What in hell do you want? That's the title of his sermon. What in hell do you want? Do you want the fire that never dies? Do you want the place where the worm is not dead and the fire is never quenched and where you burn eternally and you're separated from loved ones? And I mean, man, when he got done preaching on hell, I was so scared I just went to the altar out of fear. But you can't get saved by fear. You have to get saved by faith, and faith works by love. And if you don't have the love of God operating before you try to believe, it makes it almost impossible to believe. Well, thank God I finally stumbled into the new birth at 17. Pastor Wilson preached on how much God loved me. I took a chance. I didn't know if it were true after listening to five years of that. I remember Sister Bland, but five years of that, I took a chance. I went forward. I knelt down, asked Jesus into my heart. He came in, changed me, and the love of God, I should have never been, been removed from the message of Sister Bland. I should have stayed there. But I didn't know any better. Ignorant, ignorant, ignorant. Didn't know any better. And the people were trying to do the right thing. And please don't misunderstand me. These are good people. These are not ugly, ungodly, unholy people. These are good people. They're godly people that love God, trying to do the right thing. But sometimes in trying to do the right thing, we make a mess. Can we just rejoice today that Jesus did the right thing on the cross? And let's just receive that and believe that. And so what I want you to see is that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross took our sins, took who we were, took what we were, and the Lord Jesus Christ bore all that we were out of love. Do you see that this morning? He did that out of His love, out of His grace, out of His goodness. He did it out of love. Now, what John did, John practiced the consciousness of Jesus' love. Jesus loved these 12 disciples, even Judas, just the same. But John... God shows us through the Holy Ghost in the Gospel of John how John became much more conscious of Jesus' love than any of the other disciples, and thus he was privileged to see and to hear and to operate in things that the other ones didn't operate in. The love of God gives you access and openness to see and hear and operate in things that you'll never operate in otherwise. So here's what happened to John. He referred to himself five times as the disciple whom Jesus Loved Five times. The first time, he entered into a posture of dependence upon Jesus. And so once you begin to realize Jesus loves you, you start resting. You realize that his love will never fail. That he's never going to leave you, never fail you, never forsake you. He's never going to undermine you. He's never going to cast you out. Jesus said himself in John 6, verse 37, He that comes to me, him will I know wise cast out. Jesus will not cast you out. Jesus will not cast you out. Do you remember? At least it was in the church I grew up in. You, they were all about you coming to Jesus, but then Jesus would receive you. But then once he received you, it became the Gestapo, and this is how you had to operate. And the church I grew up in had this motto, we will clone you or disown you. It was Jesus loves you, and then it was Hail Hitler. We went from Jesus loves you to hail Hitler, and we had to keep the rules. And if you didn't keep the rules, then the bus is in the back, you're going to hell. Well, now that I understand the gospel, I've reached a place of dependence on Jesus. Jesus is my joy today. Jesus is my strength. Jesus is my life. I just lean my life on him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Just let Jesus be everything to you, Lord Jesus. I need you. Lord Jesus, I depend on you. Lord Jesus, I'm completely helpless without you. You are the vine. I'm the branch. Without you, I can do nothing. Lord Jesus, I just give everything to you. I surrender to you. Lord Jesus, I lean on you. John entered a place of dependence. He leaned on Jesus' chest, and none of the other men did. They all could have, but they didn't. John knew that Jesus loved him. The second place was at the foot of the cross, John 19, 26. John was able to hear and to see what the others could not. Significantly and most important, the face that was glorified on the mountain of transfiguration, John saw that. Peter, James, and John, all three saw that, but now Peter and James are gone. They're too far off to see this. But John looks at the cross and sees the face of Jesus marred. 
He sees what was glorified now marred beyond the recognition of any man. He sees him marred. Nobody else saw that. He also saw the garment that was glorified on the mountain now gambled over by the soldiers. So John got a revelation of the mountain and the cross. He got a revelation of the life and the death that the others did not get. And the true purpose of the cross was Jesus died so we could die. That was our death. That was what we were. That was God exacting full punishment on an old man and old life and our sins. And now the life of Jesus has been given to us that he might live in us and our life might enfold in his. Our life is flowing in Christ. Our life is flowing in Jesus. Our life is flowing in the power of God, in the wisdom of God, the spirit of God, the faith of God, the love of God. Our life is flowing in Jesus. And John saw that. So his death was my death. His life is my life. I embrace the death of Jesus is mine and the life of Jesus is mine. I embrace that. Can you receive that? Now this morning, I want to read from John chapter 20. So he embraced the purpose of the cross. Now third, he expressed patience diligence and confidence in his journey so we read here in John chapter 20 the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark that's why we don't do sunrise services you know why we don't do sunrise services because he had already risen while it was dark if you come together when the sun rises he's already gone and besides all that it's tough enough to get people here at 1030 much less 530 and I ain't coming out here and sit by myself at 5.30 in the morning. I'm just being honest. I love you, but praise God, let's get here at 10.30. Hard to get people here at 5.30 in the morning, even once a year. Even if we make breakfast for everybody. Even if the men do men's fellowship breakfast. I've preached a couple of those, and that makes for a long day. Look at it. First day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark under the sepulcher and sees the stone taken away from the sepulcher. So he was already gone while it was dark. So the sun rose in the dark. So you can sleep on to 7.30, 8 o'clock and come to church on Easter Sunday morning, 10.30. You're not missing a thing because the sun lives in you. If you want to know why we don't do sunrise service, that's why. Nothing wrong with it. If you do it by faith, you can come celebrate the resurrection of Jesus anytime. But you don't have to be here at sunrise because he's already risen. You see that? A lot of things people do out of habit and tradition rather than reading the Word of God. All right, then she runs and comes to Simon Peter, to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, which would be John. John says, she came to Peter and to me, and I'm the one he loved. See, it's not that he doesn't love Peter. It's that John say he loves me. And John is becoming more and more conscious of how much Jesus loves him. And said unto them, They've taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we not know where they have laid him. We have no idea. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they both ran together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter. That means John said, I outran Peter and came first to the sepulcher. He's stooping down. This is John. Here's humility. Stooping down, bowing himself, looking in saw the linen clothes lying, please notice this, yet went he not in. Then comes Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and see the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head lying with the linen clothes but wrapped together in a place by itself. As to say, Jesus folded the head napkin but left the grave clothes unfolded. This is very important. Verse 8, then went also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher. So John didn't go in, then he made a decision to go in. And notice John did something very important. He saw and believed. Now it's very important that you see and believe. It is extremely important that you see and believe. Notice, I've heard it preached that John didn't go in. Then went in the other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, saw and believed, for as yet they knew not the scripture, he must rise again from the dead. And that's amazing because he never taught them that he was going to die without teaching them he was going to rise again. Now please remember, the Son of Man must suffer, be killed, and raised the third day. So I want you to notice some things about John as he's practicing the love of God. Now, in the journey of Christianity, the three days and three nights are over at this point. So we thank God for three days and three nights. 
We thank God the journey of Jonah is over. Jesus said, as Jonah was in the belly of whales, so must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. So Jonah took a journey for his own disobedience. He went the wrong way and ended up in the belly of the whale at the bottom of the sea for what he had done. Jesus was cast into the waters of fallen humanity, swallowed by Adam's transgression, and taken down on the journey of our disobedience. Everything Jesus suffered in three days and three nights was because of our disobedience and our sin. And Jesus suffered our death and our curse, took it all. Jesus bore it all. That's the good news. But now these three days and three nights are over and Jesus is raised from the dead. He is risen, beloved, indeed. Jesus is alive. And the new covenant has begun. Jesus is alive. The new covenant has begun. Jesus is alive. The new covenant has begun. Jesus is alive. The kingdom of God has now been released in the earth because Jesus is raised from the dead. Jesus is raised from the dead, powerful and prophetic. The Son of God is risen. That is the hope of the covenant and the release of the kingdom. The kingdom began when Jesus was raised from the dead. You received that this morning. So the kingdom has already been released. It's already flowing. Something supernatural is already happening. It's powerful. It's prophetic. And now they come, and though it's dark, something's already happening. So let me encourage you. It may look dark in your life, but there's some things already working for you. There's some things already working. You may not see the light yet naturally, but it's already working. The Son of God got up from the dead, and while it was yet dark, and they couldn't see, and they couldn't understand, what was already working in Him had started working for them. Can you hear me this morning? What had worked in Him started working for them. They didn't know it, but it was working for them. You've got something working for you. You may not see it yet, but everything's working together for your good. God is at work. It may be dark, but the light is shining, and the glory of God has come and is risen. Indeed, Jesus is risen from the dead. So in this journey from this three days and three nights into transition, then the first thing that happens is John runs, and he runs first with Peter. And it's important that we learn to run together. It's important. Song of Solomon 1 verse 4, draw me and we will run together. When God starts drawing you and He starts drawing me, we run together. It's important that we learn to run together. We all run, but only one wins the prize, which means this. The first light on that is, if we run apart, we're going to end up a bunch of losers. You ready? We need one another. We need one another. We need one another. We need one another. So we run together. He ran with Peter. And that speaks of patience because it's going to take you some patience to run with somebody. Because when you're running with somebody, you're going to find out what they're all about. You know them buddies you used to run with? You know the people you used to run with? When you run with somebody, you're going to really find out what they're all about. So he ran with Peter. When you run with the church and you run with God's people, you're going to find out they ain't all perfect. You're going to find out they ain't all perfect. You know, when I first got saved, I thought everybody was perfect. Then I found out there were no angel wings under those shirts and under those dresses. Those were shoulder blades. Nobody in there ready to grow any angel wings. I mean, he ran with Peter, and Peter had some issues. So John, although he's very aware of how much Jesus loves him, he ran with Peter, and that's very important. I don't want to ever run without you. I run, want to run with you, and it takes a discipline to run with somebody. It takes a great deal of patience to run with somebody. It takes a great deal of consistency to run with somebody. So you're going to have to look past my flaws, and I look past your flaws. And, you know, all of us have some flaws together, and it's exposed when we run together. You'll hear things, see things, you'll watch and you'll look and you'll listen and you'll see things that aren't necessarily right. You're going to realize that perhaps sometimes my doctrine's not right or my theology may be off or sometimes you may be off, but we have to learn to run together. It's important that we run together. The locusts have no king, but they go forth by bands. It's very important that we learn to run together, but then you'll notice that John also outran Peter. And God's called you to be diligent whether other people are diligent or not. And you'll find out when you run with the saints, sometimes the saints ain't. Back in the 70s when the New Orleans Saints were such a horrible football team, they used to wear bags on their heads in the stadium. They had bags, you know, to cover the fa fans would cover their faces, and they had written on the bags, the ain'ts. The ain'ts. The ain'ts. And sometimes you find out the saints ain't diligent. 
Sometimes you find out the saints are not hungry. The saints are not motivated. The saints can really get caught up in a lackadaisical, half-hearted, go along, just move along, and just plot along, and trot along, and can get real old real quick. God's looking for you to be diligent whether other people are or not. God wants you to learn to be diligent without distraction. Diligence is very, very important because God's called you to walk with Him. He's called you to run with Him, to move with Him, and He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So I'm not going to study the Word of God because you do. I'm going to study the Word of God to learn His Word and learn His heart. And then I hope you'll come join me, but I'm not basing what I'm doing based on what you're doing. If you wait for Christians to get in the Bible, you're going to have a long wait. Your Bible will have cobwebs all over it. There are preachers that are laying their Bible down now saying, I don't even read my Bible three, four, five weeks at a time. Preachers are doing that. You can do that if you want to. I'm not going to do that. I suggest you don't do that. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to be diligent about God's Word. I want to be, if you wait for other people to pray, then you're going to have a pitiful prayer life. Most saints very rarely pray during the day. They say a prayer over their lunch or their supper, maybe their breakfast, a good night prayer before they go to bed. But if you want a prayer life, you need to be diligent. So John did outrun Peter. And I, I look back and thank God I've outrun some people. I'm not in a competition, but I'm not basing how I'm running based on them either. You got to keep up. You got to keep pace. I'm moving with God from glory to glory, from faith to faith. God wants you to be diligent about his things and put things first and put things in order and have priority in your life. God is not my second, third, fourth priority. He's first with me. Jesus is first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. I exhort first of all prayer supplications be made. I honor God with first fruits. I honor him first. That's non-negotiable with me. So John not only ran, he ran with him, but he then did outrun him. And you're going to find out that there are a lot of people who only want to go so far in God, but I pray you've got a heart to go all the way with God. Do you remember in 2 Samuel 19 the story of Barzilla? He said, I'll only go a portion, I'll not make it to Jerusalem. And our heart, our spirit is, Lord, we're going with you all the way. Till we sit in your kingdom, till we reign in your kingdom, we're going all the way. I want to go till the revelation of Jesus Christ breaks forth out of this house, till his glory is on this property, till this place is filled and full, till these buildings are built. We're not backing up or backing down, but it takes a commitment of covenant to go all the way. And it takes a diligent people that rule with a diligent hand and a persistent pursuing heart. You can't be lazy. You can't be half-hearted. You can't be lackadaisical. It takes a commitment to do anything for God. And it takes a commitment to walk with God. And commitment's not a dirty word. Commitment's not a dirty word. Nothing of value will ever be accomplished without commitment. It doesn't matter whether it's in your business life, your professional life, your private life, your home life, your public life, or your church life. It takes a commitment. So he did outrun. So just stop right now and think back over people you knew 10, 15, 20 years ago and think about the people that you've outrun. Not trying, not in a competition. I, I would to God, a lot of the people I know had outrun me, but that's just not so. When we took mom's body to the graveside the other day in Roanoke, the old crew showed up. You know, all the old crew. I saw people I hadn't seen in seven, eight, ten years. They used to go up there and preach a lot. I hadn't been going there for a while. And a lot of the old crew came out. And as we were talking, I realized that these people that at one time were, were far ahead of me in God when I started, I look back and now they're far behind me. And it's not that I tried to outrun them, it's just I kept moving, I kept diligent. Many of them, some of them, many of them got offended in church, got hurt in church, got wounded in church, quit church, backed out of church, kept going from church to church and would never plant, never let God deal with their heart, never let God deal with them. And at some point, you got to realize God wants you not only to run with people, but He wants you to move on. You need to be diligent about what you're doing. See, John was not only patient, he was diligent he outran Peter to the tomb that's important you don't want to miss that so thank God I'm a diligent saint I'm diligent about knowing the Lord I want to be diligent about faith I want to be diligent about serving him I want to be diligent about seeking first the kingdom of God got my mind set on kingdom business I've set my mind on things above I want to be diligent then number two you'll notice this that when he got to the tomb he was reluctant to go in he got there first, and he saw the linen clothes and the head napkin, but he was reluctant to go in. Now, this is what happened to me in my journey. I found out that Jesus died my death back in 1996. And I ran for about 16, 17 years till God brought me to this place in my journey, and I've been reluctant to go in because there's so many things the carnal mind will tell you, you know, you can't go in there. You can't see this. You can't have this. Because this is far beyond where we are. John had saw the death like no one else had seen. 
John had saw his face marred more than any man. He had saw the garments gambled over. He saw things. He heard the seven sayings of the cross. The others did not hear. But he was at the tomb but would not go in. The journey is not over just because you've seen the death. He looked in and it's good to look in I think everybody that sees the cross has to look into the resurrection has to look into the tomb but he would not go in and so God's saying now it's time for you to come on in I've got some more things for you it's time to come in there's a whole nother realm a whole nother life that I want you to live I've got some things for you he stooped down he humbled himself but he would not go in now Peter came to the tomb and Peter would represent the stone or those that are still moved and motivated by the law. And he came in and he saw the message. He saw what was there. And he walked out unchanged and unaffected. And you know, there are a lot of people that aren't changed or affected by this message of the life side. It's one thing to be moved by his death, but you should be just as moved by his life as you are his death. Because they're equally as powerful and they're equally as necessary and it's not a message of death or life, it's a message of death and life. And there are a lot of people that Peter walked out unmoved and unchanged and without any consequence. You can't see what's in this tomb and walk out without consequence unless you are unbelieving. So the third thing you see in John here is this, is that John received a revelation. He did go in and he did see and John writes of himself by the spirit and it said the disciple that Jesus loved went in saw and what he believed so let's get it this morning I've seen the death Jesus took my sin took my curse took what I was he died my death the cross thank you Lord for the cross thank you for the blood shed thank you forever a memorial forever a testimony but I've taken the three days journey now the three days and three nights are over Jesus is risen Jesus is alive and now I've come to this place and from within this great rock of the tomb I go in now and I see something I see that when he got up he did something very specific he took what was about the head and folded it together and laid it aside which is to say he finished his part in death he's not going back to death again he'll never die again he ended his relationship to death and Jesus of Nazareth is Lord over death hell and the grave and the curse and sin and sickness Jesus is Lord over it all he'll never go back to the death side he rose hallelujah he conquered it he folded up that napkin and said I'm the champion I won I conquered it I ain't coming back he never need die again he never need bleed again he never need suffer again he never need another hand laid on him or another piece of his beard plucked from his face or another stripe on his back he folded his part together and when you see the head napkin you say Jesus Christ conquered death conquered hell conquered the grave rose from the dead he's Lord of all you have to see that he put it away and he has ended his relationship to death he ended it that's the final word. He left them word. That was his way of saying, I've been here, I've finished it, and I walked out. You've got to see that. He finished his. Now, unless he just got sloppy, unless he just got in a hurry, he got up and neatly folded his part and laid it there, but he left that which is on the body. Good morning, body. He left what was on the body laying unfolded. You know why? Because now it's time for you to come in the tomb pick up the grave clothes fold them together and say he ended his relationship to death and that's where my ended and now I fold my grave clothes together I'm not dying anymore Amen. hallelujah hallelujah oh that's Romans 6 4 right there we are buried with him by baptism into death man get baptized in his death pick up the death garment fold it together I died in Christ I was buried in Christ I went to hell in Christ but God raised him from the dead and when he raised him he raised me and now my relationship to death is ended death is under my feet the serpent's under my feet and the scorpion is under my feet they're both under my feet I give you power to tread on serpents scorpions over all the power of the enemy it's time to fold your death garments lay them aside that's put off the old man how do you do it right there put off an old man put off an old mindset put off what you were put it off by faith put it off and lay it down you're not an old sinner saved by grace you're not just trying to make it you're not the no good the weak the mumbling stumbling bumbling fumbling bunch of people that ain't who you are that's who you used to be and that's the one that died on the cross he folded the head napkin together 
but he left the grave clothes unfolded. So that's my part. I was the body of Christ. So I go in there and I fold my grave clothes together and John said he saw and he believed. And he walked out. And when Jesus walked out of that tomb, he ain't going back. Death will never touch him again. He's not going back. He conquered it. And Paul writes, the law of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And now Romans 6, 4 said, you are free to walk in newness of life. You can walk out of that tomb ever mindful. That was your death. That was your burial. That was you being put away. That's what you were. But now I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm blood washed. I'm redeemed. I'm regenerated. I'm filled with God. I'm a son, daughter of the Most High God. And walk out with your hands raised. And as he ended his relationship to death, so we ended your relationship to death. And you can walk and I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly it's time for you to live it's time for you to get full of life it's time for you to get a mind of life a mouth full of life to live your life it's time for you to live in the name of Jesus it's time for you to live so John received a revelation he saw it I can see it this morning Jesus is not going back into death anymore Jesus is not going to be made sin again. He's not going to be touched by sin again. He's not going to suffer again. Never going to happen. That's been done. He did it for me. He did it as me. I see it. But now it's my time to fold my grave clothes together and walk out. If any man be in Christ, listen to it. If any man, are you in Christ? How do you know? It's by faith. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And what? Old things in those grave clothes. Old things are passed away we don't need any further death here we don't need any more of anything here we need to believe that his death was enough Paul says you are dead now why don't you believe that you are dead Paul says Colossians 3 3 you are dead so his death was enough and folded together by faith and now he says you are dead and you begin to walk in the newness of life for if any man be in Christ he's a new creature old things passed away now look turn around look 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 see him all things are become new there's a new day with a new covenant I've got a new promise the spirit of God's new in me I'm a new creature in Christ I'm free I'm saved I'm blessed God is my father and now God is longing for somebody to believe what he said Somebody to embrace what he said. Somebody to come and say, you are my father. Now teach me to be your son, your daughter, and I'll live what you show me. Just like the prodigal the morning after the party with a ring on his finger, a robe on his shoulders, and shoes on his feet. He's got choices to make. See it? But then John was richly, richly, richly rewarded for that same day, that same day at even time, they gathered together for fear of the Jews. John chapter 20. And when they gathered for fear of the Jews, they weren't gathered by faith. The Bible will tell you they were gathered together for fear of the Jews. They were afraid. And Jesus came in the room. He was already in the room because now he's omnipresent. He's multiplied in the Holy Ghost. And he unveils himself and he says to them, and John's standing right there, and he says, Peace be unto you and now John sees in flesh John sees in power John sees in glory John sees everything that he believed in that tomb he sees everything that he believed now manifested in a God man raised from the dead the reward was a manifestation of his revelation eight days later in John chapter 20 if you go forward Thomas wasn't with him that time you remember what they said the Lord appeared to us the Lord is risen indeed. What did Thomas say? Thomas said, except I see the wounds in his hands and put my hand in his side, I, listen to it, I will not believe. Thomas said that. Jesus appeared eight days later. That was on Sunday night, so seven days of the week. Next Sunday night, he appears to him again. And the first thing he says is, peace be unto you. What a message from a risen Savior. He didn't come to them say, why didn't you believe? He didn't come say, why did you doubt me? Why weren't you there when I was raised from the dead? I was looking for you, you weren't there. He just said, peace. And then he walks to Thomas, and this should encourage you, if you're having a struggle with your faith, he walked to the man that was unbelieving. He went right to Thomas. To the man that struggled, he went right to Thomas, and he said, Thomas, behold my hands, behold my feet pulled back the robe and said behold my side and he showed him how peace was purchased and Thomas was greatly affected by what he saw fell on his knees and said my Lord and my God and Jesus said Thomas you have believed 
because you have seen. But what did he say? Blessed? What are we talking about? The blessing? The blessing of Abraham coming? The blessing? Blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. So I've never seen him. I never got to see what John saw or Thomas saw. But I believe according to his word, he got up, folded his napkin, left the grave closed there, walked out in sovereign power. Jesus is alive forever. Jesus is glorified. And that death was my death so that his life could be my life. And I live in him, move, and have my being in him. Jesus is my life. Hallelujah. And now I'm free to walk in the life side of this. Stand with me in Jesus' name. That's long enough this morning. Let's go to our last scripture. John richly rewarded. He saw the revelation of death and life in Christ. He got to see the wounds. He got to see Christ raised from the dead. He saw it again, the revelation of death and life. And God was so gracious, he showed to all, but the others did not see what John had seen at the cross. Last scripture. Here it is again. Now, this morning, if we be dead with Christ, are you? Was his death your death? Amen. You willing to let the cross be your death? If we be dead with Christ, we believe. I'm going to believe something this morning. That we shall also live with him. See, he folded his part. He's alive. We believe if we be dead with Christ. You fold up your grave clothes right here. We believe knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. Ended his relationship to death. Folded the head cloth together. Death hath no more dominion over him. Praise God. Death can't touch him. Death is under his feet. He's above principality and power, might and dominion. Jesus is Lord. Death cannot touch him. For in that he died. He died unto sin once. Whose death did he die? Mine. But in that he lives, he lives unto God. That's all him. That's on him. Here's your part right here. Likewise, in this wisdom. Now, what does reckon mean? Come in here. Come to the tomb. You see, be diligent. Get in here. See, his part finished. He ended his relationship to death. Now fold your grave clothes together and end your relationship to death. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And you look at him. As he is, so am I. As he's seated, I'm seated. As he reigns, I reign. In Christ I live, move, and have my being. Indeed unto sin, but reckon yourself alive unto God through Jesus Christ our my old man's died, my new man lives. See, John experienced and expressed a patience, a diligence, and a confidence. In that tomb, he saw and believed. In that tomb, he saw and he believed. God wants you to see it and he wants you to believe it. It's by faith, beloved. There's no other way to get this to work. It is of faith and by faith in Jesus' name. All right, elders, come stand with me if you will. Marge, if you'll come up, we're going to pray over you. Marge, we love you. So it's always sad to say goodbye. I hate to say goodbye, but we do love you and thank you for what you gave. And from the first night we met you, you've always been a very, very honorable Christian lady. And Bob, the same. Um, we love and appreciate you. We're going to pray God's blessing on you, God's favor on your journey, and uh, everything working for your good that you're out there and you're exactly where God wants you to be. So let's stretch your hands this way. We're going to pray for Marge. Now you lay your hands on her and let's just believe God. Father, for Bob and Marge, their family and extended family, children and grandchildren, we bless them. Thank you for sending them to Open Door Fellowship. Thank you for allowing us to meet her the night she walked Tommy on this property. And we thank you for the relationship, the time she's played music, and the time she's given and served and loved, and we fellowshiped and we laughed, and the time she came to help give out food, and all the things I remember about Bob and Marge. Lord, the times Bob and I had talked and we had shared and the soundboard that Bob gave us and all the things that Bob has done and given to this church and the faithfulness of their tithing and giving, Lord, thank you. We thank you for their faithfulness. We thank you for their heart. We thank you for them. And so, Lord, as we release them today, we release them to that area of Washington and Seattle up there where they're going. We release them to blessing, to the body of Christ, to the favor of God. We thank you for them. We thank you for the seed they sown here. And I pray the seed they have sown here will multiply there. 
And, Lord, it will just be manifested, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And I thank you for peace. I thank you for protection. I thank you for prosperity in this move. I thank you that things go right. I thank you that everything is working for their good, and you're bringing them to a greater place. And what we imparted to them, what they learned here, what they received here, they'll take with them. They'll continue to feed with us by Internet and grow with us. And I thank you, Lord, that they'll never be the same for having been with us, and we'll never have been the same for they having been with us as well, that we're changed by your glory in Jesus' name. Bless them protect them on their journey thank you for them in jesus name in jesus name in jesus name and if you need prayer this morning i want to encourage you to come i want to encourage you to take your place and come up here if you need prayer if you want prayer you need help please come but now don't go out of here and not do something about what you just heard do it like this all right lord pastor said to go in the tomb i'm going in the tomb by faith i'm gonna take my grave clothes fold them up i'm gonna walk in newness of life his death was my death. His life is my life. The cross was enough. The cross dealt with my sin, dealt with me, put me away, and now he lives in me. I'm a new creature. Will you do what the Bible says? Be a doer, not a hearer only. Don't forget today at 5 o'clock, for those of you that ushers, greeters, and uh, women's ministry, please come join us at 5. You're signed up for the financial peace class. We'll see you at 3. Now, the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. This is the blessing of Abraham. It is the blessing of the seed of Abraham. If you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise, and you are richly blessed. The blessing of the Lord makes rich. Be fruitful, multiply, subdue, replenish, have dominion in your earth, and walk as sons and daughters of God. In Jesus' name and in agreement, we said together, A.